who is the greatest among you, let him be servant of all. Welcome to another episode of Building Great Leaders. Uh, we are going to be continuing the examples of how a believer is to live in the midst of persecution, how we should be preparing as believers in this generation for the rejection of truth and the rejection of pure doctrine. And we will be finishing the session that we began on the coming judgment of God as we looked at the coming day of the Lord, we kind of subtitled that global warming. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek, but yet it is indeed going to be when God's final judgment comes, it is going to be a devastating time. And we have the responsibility now of proclaiming the truth of praying for God to give people the courage to stand firmly in the midst of adversity, in the midst of rejection. We finished our last segment, which I'm going to beef up just a little bit more, on what is the warning to believers during this time. What are we to do? How are we to be careful in these final days? So let's turn again to 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to focus again on verse 17. That is a, a warning to believers. 2 Peter 3, 17. Therefore, beloved, seeing that ye know these things. In other words, knowing that what is coming. Seeing that you know these things. Beware. There is a caution here. A warning. Beware lest you also being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You've been grounded in solid truth. You have been given the prophetic word. You have been given the word that Peter is giving to the saints, preparing them for the onslaught of persecution, reminding them that they are pilgrims and strangers, pilgrims in this land, strangers just journeying through uh, this time until we get to our eternal home. And so what are we to do? We are to be careful that we do not fall from our steadfastness. And we will look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, we'll look at that, uh, at that aspect. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14 through 18. And Timothy says, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them to before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to subverting of the hearer. Study to show yourself approved unto God. In other words, there are people are going to come in uh, with words, argumentative type words that profit nothing, but it'll be subverting those who are hearing. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his, and let every one that named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So again, we're given a warning there in, by Timothy of this time when we should be careful and be alert to the things that are, that are coming. When we see what things will pop up, we'll, I want to read real quickly Jude here. In Jude chapter, well, it's, it's just Jude 4. He said, For there are certain men crept in unawares. What are we to be aware of in these last days? 
Certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. That's a very key phrase here. In other words, they've turned grace into disgrace. And they, they use the word love being loving as though you can overlook all kinds of things. And that which is free grace to them, they turn into a lifestyle that is dishonoring. And it says, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying, note this, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What are they? Again, they're denying the Lordship of Jesus Christ over their life. It's not that they're just denying the Lord. They're denying the fact that he is not going to be Lord over their lives. They are going to live their lives the way they want to live their lives. And sadly, many will go into this uh, easy, in fact, Dr. McLaughlin calls it sloppy agape. And it's, it's a love that is not a solid, genuine, biblical love that has discernment that Paul exhorts the believers to have. And so, be careful, be cautious, because people will creep in and they will subtly bring in this whole mentality that you do not have to be living such a strict kind of a life that you will just uh, use your freedom that you have in Christ. In fact, the term that Paul used in Galatians is a military term. It's an operating base to go into carnal uh, activities. Don't Use your freedom to go into these carnal activities, that freedom that you have in Christ. And then we look <clears throat> at what are the believer's responsibilities now in light of his coming. We have been warned. Let me read something that I thought was very interesting. I used to present it to our staff at the college, reminding us that if we are not careful, we can let things slip. Harvard College, still a very popular college today, founded in 1636. What was the purpose of the founding of Harvard University? The training of pastors. That's what they were founded for, to train pastors. In 1632, an early booklet entitled New England's First Fruits was distributed for the purpose of raising funds for the new college. Harvard's stated purpose was to lead a student to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 17, 3, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. This was recorded in American Education, The Colonial Experience by Lawrence Kremen. Requirements for entrance to Harvard, everyone shall consider the main end of his life and studies to know God and Jesus Christ, which is life eternal. That was the required for entrance into Harvard. Harvard's requirements once they were admitted, read the Bible twice daily, report on what was learned, could not skip classes, could not leave campus without teacher's permission. Those violating college rules were disciplined and often publicly. William and Mary, founded in 1693, purpose, furnish seminary for ministers of the gospel. That was William and Mary. Yale, founded in 1701, purpose, to be a truer school of the prophets. Harvard became suspect of holding Unitarian and rationalistic views, more conservative than Harvard from the start. Yale sent an evangelistic team around the country proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior until 1825. Uh, Woodrow Crowell in The Vanishing Ministry records this on page 52. Rhode Island College, 1764, now Brown University, founded by Baptists to train Baptist pastors. Dartmouth College, 1769, trained missionaries to the American Indians. The story goes on and on and on. What happened? Creeps came in. While the majority of college graduates of the 17th century entered <coughs> the ministry as preachers or missionaries, this percentage dropped to 50%, 1750, 22% in 1801, 6.5% in 1900, 
Among freshmen who entered college in the fall of 1980, less than half of 1% indicated clergy as their probable career occupation. And so I, I could go on here, but I'm going to stop. At, what am I illustrating? The fact that creeps can't come in. Oftentimes in the name of love, oftentimes in the name of liberty, but liberty that is licentiousness, not liberty that is causing me to be free to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Warnings to believers. Now, what are believers' responsibilities now in light of these coming events? Well, how, how should we then live? Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. Seeing then all these things that shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? So phase number one here is to be holy. How are we to live in light of present circumstances? How are we to live in a world that is going at a breakneck speed away from God's absolute truth? Be holy. And he says, how should we live? What manner of persons Ought we to be as we look at that? I'd like to look at 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. In other words, your entire lifestyle needs to reflect holiness because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So what is the believer's responsibility today? To live a holy life. Because your behavior is affected by how you perceive what is coming in these days ahead. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13 says we are to be blameless in holiness. In other words, we are not to be living lives that are reckless, that are careless, lives that are other than blameless, where people can look and say, he professes to be a believer, she professes to be a believer. Is this really what's going on? Be holy and without blame. First Thessalonians 5.23, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the command that we are to have. That's the sanctification process. After I become a born-again believer, the indwelling Holy Spirit empowers me to be holy. I have to reflect the fruit of the Spirit. I cannot struggle to become a holy person. I have to let the indwelling Spirit of God do His work within me through the Word of God that holiness would be a result of my lifestyle and being zealous of good works. And so not only to be holy, we are to be watchful. Peter exhorts the child of God to be watching for the coming day of the Lord. We're to be living with expectation. As I mentioned in a previous episode uh, up at the Gishigumi Bible Camp where I, I remember way back even from the mid-50s, I would walk by a sign that was on a tree going across the bridge to the preaching tabernacle, and the sign simply said, perhaps today. A constant reminder, it could be today that the Lord would come in the rapture, that he would call his church home, and it would begin the progression of what was going on uh, to, to the believer and on to glory and on to Christ-like ultimate conformity. Be watchful in prayer. 2 Peter 3.12, looking for and hastening unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So we are to be watchful. That day is coming. How are we to live in light of that? I think it helps so much for us to be in the word and Particularly, I think we have been neglectful of the book of Revelation. And there are promises made that if we will read that book, God promises 
that we shall be blessed for reading Revelation. Why? Because it is so packed with reminders to be watchful as believers in this, in this time. And that is uh, it's so crucial. And then thirdly, we are to be pure. And uh, John reminds the born-again believers that if they have the hope of his coming, they will live pure lives. The oft-quoted verse, 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. We are not going to be sons of God. We are the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. There's a purifying effect of keeping in mind the Lord's coming for us. Living a pure life in light of the coming of the Lord. How crucial that is for us as we, uh, as we live our lives. And, you know, we're going to be constantly bombarded. Uh, temptations will be constantly coming our way. The bombardments that distract us from our love to the Lord. And impurities begin to come in. And Peter says, stir up your pure minds. Stir them up. It's not something you, you make a decision, then you're, you're totally living in victory. No, you have to constantly be living in light of that. Uh, we look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might present that which is good and perfect will of God. And so good and acceptable and perfect will of God, that's how you become a gap man, a gap person, standing in the gap in this generation. Be good, be uh, in that position and be pure in your minds. And so we are reminded to be holy, to be pure. And I think that's what uh, Peter is warning about here, that we should be diligent. Look in verse 14 of 2 Peter 3. Seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Without spot. Now, when you look at, at the book of Jude, and it's also in some other Revelation passages, it talks about being spots in the feast. Jude, verse 13. Actually, we'll look at verse 11 and 12 and 13. For unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam and perished in the gainsaying of Kor, Korah. Three examples of Old Testament. Cain, and there we find Korah, and Balaam. And Balaam was one who got people turned aside, intermingling with the world. And whenever you try these kind of things, when you, you try getting these, these blending of things together, you always end up in a very difficult scenario. And Balaam could not curse God's people, but through counsel, he got them to go into sin by intermarrying. And uh, verse 12, they are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, <coughs> plucked up by the roots. And this interesting word, spots in your feast, it's uh, really hidden rocks or reefs. In other words, they come in, everything looks smooth, but, but they, you will shipwreck your faith by intermingling uh, with those kind of things. And they feed in themselves without fear. 
they're just, they're just very wicked and love it. And it said, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom they reserve the blackness of darkness forever. And so you have those who would try to get you away from living that pure life. And then he says, be growing. Not only are we to be holy in light of these circumstances, not only are we to be watchful, not only to be pure, but we are to be growing. And we look in 2 Peter chapter 3 as he comes to a conclusion here. And keep in mind, this is the Peter who denied Christ, denied that he knew him. This is the Peter that that Jesus said, Peter, I'm praying for you for when you are converted. I want you to strengthen the brethren. And this is what he is doing here. Peter is strengthening the brethren by his instruction and by his challenge. Because now that he knows that God has appointed him an apostle, what an awesome responsibility that he has. And what does he say? Verse 17, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, therefore beware lest you also being led away with the air of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. But he makes a contrast here. Don't drift. Don't be drawn aside. Don't be careless. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. What a challenge. Grow in grace and knowledge. And boy, when you look at how he started 2 Peter chapter 1, and we, we see the, the urgency that he uses here. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, and beside this, besides what? Peter is giving them who they are in Christ, their position in Christ, the purity that they can have in Christ. They are partakers of, of the divine nature, they have no not they have a clean knowledge of the person of Christ, and know the power that's available. And he said, and beside all this, having escaped the world from lust, beside all this, give all diligence. Very key word here. This is not to be taken casually. If I am going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, I cannot take my Bible, do a real quick blurb in the morning, head into the rest of my day, forgetting all about that. We have to become people who will saturate ourselves with the Word of God. And, and to do that, we have to give all diligence. It's not a casual approach. Uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, after 3,000 were converted after we see this great harvest of souls. How did the church continue the day the church was founded? And they continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine. In other words, indoctrination became key. And fellowship, communication became key. And breaking of bread, commemoration was key. And prayer, communication in prayer with God, the supplication that comes in our lives. And as we look at the challenge, they continued steadfastly. To me, that parallels 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. And beside all this, besides our position in Christ, our possession in Christ, the power that we have in Christ, we've been partakers of his divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. Beside all this, give all diligence. In other words, this is not a maybe thing or a hope so thing or a casual thing. We have to make our determination to give all diligence to do what? Add to your faith. Add. It's not just, okay, I'm saved. I'm satisfied. But we have to grow. Peter's final exhortation at the end of his letter, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How does he say that? Giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, 
the brotherly kindness, love. This is giving the challenge. Why? Because look in verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is saying, you can't say, well, I'm going to accept Christ and just sit. I, I, I'm going to be saved, but not grow beyond that point. Peter says, grow in grace and in the knowledge. How? Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, temperance patience, patience godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. Why? If these things are in you and they are abounding, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in what? In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is an epinosis. That is a full knowledge of him. Perhaps we've been too casual. Perhaps we have been too reckless regarding our commitment to grow in grace and in knowledge. Perhaps we're just satisfied to take this book and take it to church, or now that COVID has hit, there's, we just keep it at home. But we have everything else in our minds except giving all diligence to this matter of growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Why? We as believers are living to the glory of God and we are to give all glory to him for what he has done for us. How do we live in a dark, decaying age, continuing in our growing? Be holy, be watchful, be pure, be growing that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. But that means we better be determining to live pure, holy lives. God, I, I'm so thankful for your word. Forgive us, Father, when we have been careless and reckless regarding the command, the imperatives to give all diligence. We've overlooked being steadfast. But Father, may we commit in this day that we would be bold in the knowledge of you, bold in our proclamation of you. For your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.